As we continue our remarks today, I didn't ask permission to do this. I ask now. I'd like to shove this morning's topic down a little bit and deal with something that I've been studying, which continues last night's idea and theme. There is a trend amongst us today to disallow the doctrines of the Bible. People don't want anything said to them or told to them that requires discipline and change and reformation, which is change. Elder Pearson made an appeal in a, an editorial some time ago, and he mentioned in this appeal the tendency amongst us to want to de-emphasize the great truths that have made us what we are. Our people are not saying we don't believe these things, just don't talk about them anymore. And this is dangerous and sad, yea, even tragic. But this is a general problem in the world of Christendom. It was differences in doctrinal views that separated the Christian church into so many religious bodies. Now, I want to say right now that if men believe the Bible and the Bible only, then all Christians would believe the same thing and follow the same faith and keep the same Sabbath. For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and oneness, unity, is stressed throughout the New Testament. It is because men have pet views and traditional ideas that we are thus divided. It is not the Bible's fault, and that ought to be said. But I say again, it was Bible doctrines that gave strength to various movements. Some time ago, the Bible began to lose its influence, its status. People began to lose confidence in the Word of God. The reason is that the Bible condemns them, so they must condemn the Bible. It condemns so many of their little pet sins, things they don't want to give up, don't intend to give up. But they are willing now to turn their backs on the Word of God. And when men turn their backs on the Bible, doctrines are no longer interesting. They are willing to put them aside. And as doctrines are put aside, the world of Christendom today is discovering only that they hold so many things in common. And the things which they hold in common are common things. So that the church today almost fits the description that Governor George Wallace gave to the Republican and Democratic parties. twiddle dee and twiddle dee -dum. Not much difference between them. One not much different than another. Doctrinal walls breaking down means that many people don't know what they stand for. As a matter of fact, they admit... We stand for nothing in particular. And I want to say to us this morning that we ought to stand for something. For if you don't stand for something, you'll soon stand for anything and amount to nothing. And when that happens, we are thrown into the melting pot with everyone else, no longer distinctive, peculiar, as the Bible puts it. But rather, there is produced a kind of miserable toleration, not based on charity and love, but based on the fact that we do not hold anything worth dying for, let alone living for. The truth is that most church people don't know what they believe. If you don't believe that, ask them. And yet God says that we should be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is within us with meekness and with fear. There are external pressures producing this unity of churches. Pressures such as worldliness, materialism, communism even, driving people together. Churchmen who like to see this 
are appealing for union because they feel that if we all flow together, there will be added strength. But what is happening is we are ushering in a new dark age. An age without scripture, without principles, without standards, without morals. And we are now seeing the reaping of such sowing. Mergers of great denominations are hailed as wonderful achievements. And some of them are improbable mergers. They defy the imagination. But God has already said something about this kind of federation in Isaiah chapter 8. He said it will fail. It will come to nothing. The surrender of authoritative teachings in the various churches is giving fertilizer to a crop of humanism and arid speculation and ludicrous philosophy producing an insipid hodgepodge of Christianity that is hardly worth taking time for. And that's why so many people today don't take time for it. On the other hand, something else is happening. Walter Horton has said that students, and it's surprising that he mentioned students in particular, but he said students living without standards are involved in such a mental strain that is so unbearable they are ready to follow any religion or any religious guide which has an air of certitude. You see, people are religious. They don't like Christianity because its standards are so high, but they are yet religious. And students trying to live without standards are under such pressure that suddenly they are giving in and joining anything that appears to be sure-footed. And that's why we have the Moonies and, and the Hare Krishnas and whatever else they are called. Coupled with this trend of Protestant disintegration is the growing power of Rome. Protestants are declaring today that the Bible is not really that reliable. There are parts of it that are all right. Other parts of it interesting reading, but certainly not the divinely inspired Word of God. It's just a nice book, a mixture of folklore and platitudes. This is what Protestants are saying. Protestant denominations around which once stood solid walls of Scripture now have only wooden fences to try to stay off the raging wildfire of Rome. Today the United States is considered the most powerful political nation on earth. Rome, the greatest religious power in the world. And the two of them have a common enemy in communism, and each considers the other absolutely indispensable to its survival. And they declare the bond must be tighter, and we must be drawn closer together. And with this idea, we begin to see a declension of liberty in our beloved country. With the shattering of the economy in recent years, coupled with national insecurity, we have created economic instability and fear throughout our nation. And men are thinking now about what can be done, what antidote applied that will save us from what seems to be inevitable. And they call for stronger governmental regulations. Jimmy Carter campaigned against this, but now that he is in office, he seems to be calling for it also. Stronger federal influence and even interference. Let us think of some of the things that seem almost totally unrelated. The oil crisis, for instance. Out of Washington, D.C., where I move and work, has come the notion time and time and time again that there ought to be one day in the week in which all businesses of all kinds are closed because of the energy crisis. Now they say it will not only save oil, but electricity. If all the department stores and all the grocery stores and all the other businesses are shut up one day of the week, 
Now, you don't have to wonder which day they have in mind. There is also a proposal voiced around for an econo religion, or a religion based on economics. A religion, they say, that has a charitable approach, which means that all foods and all supplies would be available to all, and all would have the same opportunity to buy at the same time. Eventually, this would lead to control of buying and selling, which relates to a prophecy very familiar to us. Buying and selling, a process central to the functioning of any free society and vital to the life of every citizen. If this continues to snowball, the devil will have the stage set for the accomplishment of his religious coup under the guise of economic expediency. And it's happening while we sit here this morning. There are now dark, threatening clouds on the horizon of freedom. In our second century as a nation, men are speaking ominously of the twilight of democracy and the ending of human rights. That's why our president is talking so much about human rights today. On the contracted horizon, there are lengthening shadows that we should be able to see and interpret. There is such a thing as a computer being built into which they hope to feed information on every person born into the world. These shadows are not to frighten us, ladies and gentlemen. Shadows will throw light on Revelation 13, that great prophecy which is inexorably interlocked with the third angel's message. Our history today is a history of the secularization of man. The history of the increasing dominance of science with its apparent ability to explain all mysteries of life and to provide comforts and satisfactions for man. Science has played a key role in the secularization of our country and one of our great leaders has said that secularism is practical atheism. And that is worth our thought this morning. For man in his sinful state tends naturally to confine his thoughts to this world. And science today allows no world beyond this world. And no God, they say, is needed as an aid in improving this world. And religious leadership, almost universally, is capitulating to science so that there is no check on secularization and I will tell you, in case you don't know, that this is a cold, hard, pitiless, unkind world without God. Men and women who have never been touched by the mystery of grace don't know how to be merciful and compassionate. And we have today what the economic world refers to as a rat race society, where dog eats dog and where stealing is considered even legitimate under certain circumstances. And in case you don't know it, white-collar crime is a greater menace than the other kind, though often less violent. New national disgraces are coming every day. Arnold Toynbee, the historian, says the fundamental conflict is not political but religious. The temptation to worship himself instead of worshiping a now revealed true God has never ceased to beset man. This fatal choice between God worship and man worship is the ultimate issue which challenges all lives in our generation. And for an historian, I think he stated it very well. Satanic forces are operating in science, in philosophy, in religion and in education, to take the reality of God out of life, to make him unnecessary in the explanation of nature, and then to vaporize him into some kind of pantheistic God, or worse yet, to eliminate him altogether as irrelevant to human needs. And let me pause to say, beloved, that is why the devil despises the Sabbath. Now, when I do evangelism, people will come up to me with sincere questioning and say, Pastor, why is a day so important? And some of our own people have wondered why it's so important. Well, I would like to emphasize one reason why it's so important. First of all, the true Sabbath is a memorial 
of creation. And it honors God. It honors God in a unique and singular manner. It points to God as the only true God. And in Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 12 and 20, God says the Sabbath is a sign that He is God. That's why the devil hates it. That's why a day is so important. It's not just a, an argument or a quibble over 24 hours. It is an attack on an institution that points to God as the only true God and to Christ as the creator of heaven and earth. And when a person accepts the Sabbath, and it becomes the seal of sanctification in his life. That person can never be an atheist. That person can never become an agnostic. The person who truly observes the Sabbath in spirit can never be an idolater. And the reason is that once a week, not once a year as we celebrate and honor certain men, but once a week, that man observes a 24-hour period in honor of the true God who created the heavens and the earth. As long as he does that with that regularity, he can never be an idolater or an atheist. The devil knows this. And that's why the devil despises the Sabbath and those who keep it. And we ought to be clear on that. Once man believed that the earth was the center of the universe, and that all of God's attention was focused upon him, but then Copernicus came along and, and discovered that there were myriads of worlds and man could not enlarge his faith to match his enlarged view of this vast universe and his confidence in God was shattered. He thought God certainly cannot see me as an individual if he has all these other worlds to look after. Further, he thought God does not care about me. God does not watch over me. I'm not sure about a God like that. He thought of himself as a tiny little object on a tiny little world whirling around in God's vast universe. And this tinctured his life with skepticism. Made him think he could get by, that God wasn't looking, that no record was being kept, that God did not care. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many who feel that way today, right in the church of the living God. And so man decided, I'd better look after myself. And this is a problem amongst us. Faith to pay an honest tithe. Faith to be a true steward, giving systematically, week after week. Not because the church needs something, but in honor of the Lord. We don't have that kind of faith yet. We feel that if I do this, I can't afford it. We don't know that we can't afford not to do it. Can God really take care of me? Pastor, if I go along with that program, won't I really starve? Or have to deny my family and myself of real needs of life? We have that same problem. And so when man decided he'd better look after himself, soon his feeling of inadequacy gave way to a feeling of self-sufficiency. For man has been given great wisdom. And with a few successes, he began to think he didn't need God after all. We ought to settle this amongst us today. How big is God? What kind of God is it that we do serve? Del Decker sings, He's big enough to rule the mighty universe, yet small enough to live within my heart. That's the kind of God we serve. We ought to understand today, there is a relationship between the finite and the infinite. We ought to understand that we are little. We are nothing. The whole earth, just a drop in the bucket. All things are little to our magnificent God. Even our vastness is a vastness of littleness. And that only emphasizes the unspeakable love of God that he can still care and would give of himself to die for the sins of any one of us. When I read that his eye is on the sparrow, it is overwhelming. If God cares about a little bird, certainly he cares about me. Let us then not cast away our confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ladies and gentlemen, if heaven becomes unreal to you, and if you can no longer think of heaven as the ultimate goal, the climax of the gospel, the place to which Christ will take his people, then this earth will become all important. 
And you will become totally materialistic. If you lose sight of those mansions that Christ has gone to prepare, and if you stop believing in that, then buying a home in Walla Walla will consume all of your energy and all of your funds and all of your interest and all of your affections, and that home will become your God. For whatever takes preeminence in your life is your God. If you lose faith in the fact that treasures are laid up for you in heaven, then greed and avarice will consume your soul, and you will extort and beg and steal until you become the richest body in the cemetery. Ladies and gentlemen, if you lose sight of the fact that Christ is going to take his people home for a lifetime, an eternal lifetime of joy, if you stop believing that, then you will give yourself over to excitement and to an unending hedonistic orgy of pleasure-seeking here on earth. And that will consume and debauch you until you are wretched and miserable and good for nothing. And there are some people trying to do exactly that. To put God out of their minds, to put the prophecies out of their minds, to think of nothing but this world and make the best of it. But man was created with a different conscience. And therefore man hears distant rumblings and sees blinding flashes. And his scientific genius has produced weapons capable of destroying the whole world. And now man fears that. A great deal of turmoil is going on in New England right now. Because they want to build, build nuclear power plants up there. And hundreds and thousands are flooding into the area to protest. Men are living in constant fear. And much of it has been brought about by their own scientific genius. Man sees himself now doomed to annihilation. They have little hope that civilization can continue. They feel that all nations are caught up in mutually suicidal endeavors, and that one day the whole world will go up in flame. Well, it will, but not the way they think. Past history has no parallel for us. Those of us privileged to live at this time and to see the storm approaching must understand that we are living in a unique age. We are on the edge of an abyss, and no other age has ever faced a time like this. And so people are turning to religion again. But they are not returning to the truth. They are turning to Eastern mysticism. They are turning to religion of chance. And, and, and they are asking for what a lady called the other day a crutch, something to lean on, but not to the truth. I would suggest they'd better look hard at this, and they'd better do it now. For man's neo-orthodoxy is neither large enough nor strong enough to hold his soul as the storm breaks. There are so many religious abstractions, so many weak links in the chain, so many failures, so many ludicrous liberalisms. Paul spoke of it when he said, they have a form of godliness, but they are denying the power thereof. And the liberal ideas and concepts that are being propagated today offer no escape from the dilemma man finds himself in. Man has lost faith in the Bible and faith in God, and now he cannot have faith in his fellow man. This is a part of the dilemma. Man once thought that he was like an angel, an embryo angel, he was called by the sociologists. But now as he reads the newspapers and watches the television, he can see plainly that demons are in control of men's minds. Man lost faith in the law of God. And today, there is a generation of lawless people who will not obey the law of the land. Men have abandoned heaven as a hope. And anybody who talks about it is called a doomsdayer. Some of you probably saw that story in Newsweek in December of last year, in which they talked about doomsday religions, and they listed Seventh-day Adventists in that article. Doomsdayers, they call us. So anybody who looks forward to Christ's coming and the end of this world and a better life in heaven is listed as a doomsday and is made a laughing stock. Men want to view this earth as a potential heaven, but they realize that it's not working out. They have minimized and abandoned the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. And they talk today about behavior modification. They're in favor of a social gospel. Save man where he is. 
improve his environment and he will improve morally. In other words, plant a few daisies in the pig pen and the prodigal son can be happy right where he is. It simply does not work. They have sought salvation through education only to discover the universities have become centers of filth. Much of the moral rottenness of today began on college campus amongst pot-smoking junkies. Co-eds are sent off to school to become profligates, living in dormitories where they go into each other's rooms and even share the same bathrooms. It is incredibly stupid if you ask me. Every subtle form of evil springs up on campuses where people are supposed to have good sense. So that today sinners are simply smarter sinners. Our campuses are producing impeachable politicians and disbarred lawyers. And our penitentiaries are full of men with degrees. There is no salvation in education alone. And then they have shamed us out of our evangelistic spirit somewhat. They've talked about the science of comparative religions and they've said one religion is as good as another. Don't go around the world peddling Christianity. Learn to respect Buddhism and Hinduism and, and Mohammedanism and all the others. Learn to respect a man for what he is. They don't need Christ. And so what has happened? These non-Christian nations are now seething. They are terrorists. They are explosive. They are revolutionaries. They are threatening to blow up the whole world. They take innocent men and women hostage. They cut off the heads of people who haven't done one thing against them. It is a dangerous thing to live in a world where men do not know Christ. Newsweek said that some of the heads of states are certifiable madmen. Because we pulled in our tentacles and felt that we were bigots if we kept, tried to peddle Christianity against their homespun religions. Man has sought to harmonize his religious ideas with science, and whenever there is a conflict, he abandons religion in favor of science, and now science has betrayed him. Instead of being the new messiah, which they once called science, Instead of being the new Messiah to save man from sickness and lengthen his life and give him control over the elements, science has become a great monster giving him war and pollution. It has affected the ozone layers, producing, they say, a hundred thousand cases of skin cancer next year simply because people use spray cans. Science has turned on man, producing plagues. And many believe capricious weather. This has been an unusual year. And Mrs. Dower said to me the other day, I believe it's nothing more than the devil himself working in nature. Mrs. White said that's exactly what would happen. Science has brought to man the threat of oblivion. In view of these crises, Protestant leaders will be subdued in their arrogance. They will turn again to religion. They will seek to draw back and they will talk about unity. They are afraid and insecure standing alone. They will say, let us get together and have a new strength to meet new paganism. And there will be overtures toward Rome. That's all in the prophecy. In the face of all this, we ask the question this morning, is there any word from the Lord? Does God have anything to say to our age? And the answer, affirmatively, yes. And it was read by us this morning in the book of Revelation, chapter 14. We refer to God's remedy as the three angels' messages. The message that God has given to us to bear. The last warning message to a doomed world. And the first angel came with the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. To a world that has abandoned the gospel, the first thing is to bring the gospel back again. The world does not believe any longer in the fall of man. And whenever people abandon the idea that man has fallen, they see no need of Christ to lift man from his fall. That's our problem today. 
And so the first angel says, the everlasting gospel must be heard again, and it must be heard everywhere. It must go to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And Isaiah said that we are called to build again the old foundations. We are the restorers of the breach. And I would like to say to us today, it's not a strange gospel, it's the everlasting gospel. God is not calling us to be fanatics. God is not calling us to become queer. You may be as holy as you want to be by the power of the Holy Spirit without becoming queer and fanatical. God does not require it. It does not help his cause for us to become that way. Men have abandoned the idea that the whole world needs Christ. And so the first angel calls attention to man's need of Christ, saying, Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and fountains of waters. And the Bible declares all things were made by him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The world has abandoned the idea of a personal God who is big enough to control the universe and yet small enough to control their lives, to protect and to defend them. They have accepted some kind of pantheistic God enmeshed in nature's processes. We are to carry the everlasting gospel which says the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Why should it be carried? For the hour of his judgment is come. In the Protestant world today, there seems to be no clearly defined eschatological belief. And anybody who has one is mocked as a doomsdayer. They are saying, let us improve this world. And yet now they admit that some kind of end to all things is coming. Well, we need to tell them that the judgment hour has come. That the climax of the judgment hour is the second coming of Christ. We need to tell them that the world is not rushing to some blind end, but to a judgment bar. They need to feel the pangs of accountability. This gives meaning to life. People who feel they can sin with impunity will sin with abandon. Men need to understand that they have got to answer for what they do. They are free to do as they please, but for all these things, there is time and judgment. We are living in a day when men are abandoning morals. They need to be told that the judgment will bring them face to face with the holy law of God, which is a transcript of his character. And for every time they have stolen or lied or committed adultery, they will have to answer before the law. This is the everlasting gospel. They've even abandoned the idea of sin. And when you abandon the idea of sin, you abandon the idea of Christ's atoning ministry as our high priest in heaven, working out salvation for us who are in our weakness. They don't even want to call it sin anymore. They call it a mistake or impropriety or bad taste or almost anything except what it is. It is sin. And the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Christ is involved in his sanctuary ministry right now, applying his own blood to wash away sin. And men need to know that this is going on. The first angel's message was sent as an answer to man's dilemma. Then the second angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Ellen White says that that fall is progressive. She continues to fall. In Great Controversy, page 389, we read, The message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. The churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of their refusal of the light of the Advent message. But that fall was not complete. They have continued to reject the special truths for this time. They have fallen lower and lower and have not yet reached their culmination. Ladies and gentlemen, it has happened. It has come to the place, even in religious circles, that if you hold to some moral standard, you're laughed at. You're considered foolish. And every conceivable kind of dirt is being practiced and promoted today. And when I say that, I mean in churches. Babylon is fallen. One of the great and sophisticated churches of our land recently ordained a known lesbian as a priest and then defended the ordination 
And that lesbian priest said, my lesbianism makes me understanding of others' problems. Babylon is fallen. I have here an article which I clipped out of the Washington Star, and it says that a bishop okays hamburgers and soft drinks for communion. Babylon is fallen. Make no mistake about it. And she continues to fall. They speak of homosexual churches today, trying to normalize perversion and sodomy and cover it with a cloak of Christianity. Babylon is fallen. And this foolishness has turned off people by the hundreds of thousands. And yet, feeling this unbearable pressure, they turn to Reverend Moon, or to the Muslims, or to Hinduism, or to the Hare Krishnas, or to something. And eventually all of this will be culminated in a threefold charismatic delirium to oppose God's people. Revelation 18 is a reaffirmation of the second angel's message in more thunderous tones, as though God wanted to say it again and say it for the last time in one great final appeal. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It is significant how God repeats himself in the Bible. And I read somewhere that this was characteristic of God. It sort of shows the outpouring of his heart when he says a thing more than once. Back in Old Testament times, when Abraham was about to offer his son Isaac, and God was ready to stop him, he said, Abraham, Abraham, called his name twice. When Jesus came along, Jesus used to say, verily, verily. He didn't say it once, but twice. Isaiah said, with a stammering tongue, would God speak to this people. When he was talking to Peter about the danger of his soul, he said, Simon, Simon. And on the cross of Calvary, he cried out, My God, my God! And in the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White says, Flow together, flow together, flow together. God says it more than once. And in his desperation to help us understand our desperation, God says, Babylon is fallen, not once but twice, is fallen. He's trying to impress us. That religion is in a mess today. And that there is one clear, true way. And then the third angel followed, saying, If any man worship the beast in his image, or receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the last judgments of God, his ministry of wrath, the seven last plagues, will come upon such. But the prophecy speaks of ruin, American Protestantism, and world paganism being united. It's all there in Revelation chapter 13. And ladies and gentlemen, we can see these things happening now. Paul said they turned from God because they glorified him not as God. But rather, they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. Protestantism today is denying creation. They're foremost in doing it. You don't hear Rome saying so much about it. It's the Protestant world that is talking about evolution. They even try to speak of it in unoffensive, unobtrusive terms by saying a mini-evolution. What is that? It's like saying mini-adultery. How can it be? With creation gone, with them giving up on it and swallowing the theory of evolution, hook, line, and sinker, there is no need to think of a God who could create. They have substituted Sunday and taken away Sabbath, which reminds the world of God. But I tell you today, they are Bible-loving Protestants in all communions. And by the way, Ellen White says the majority of God's people are still out there in other communions. That's why those of us who do evangelism work so hard. And that's why we try to be tactful. And that's why we pray as earnestly as we do. Because the majority of God's people are still out there. And they love the Word of God. They're in confusion. Some of them are disenchanted. They are waiting to hear. And they must hear the three angels' messages. And central in that, the Sabbath, the sign and seal of God. The mark that God is God. The true God, the only God, the creator of heaven and earth. It is a way of understanding that we did not come from monkeys. It is a way of understanding that the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. 
It is a way of understanding that he who created the heavens and the earth can take away our sins and create in us a new heart. The world is not in the grip of a cold, senseless force, but a divine being who created this world not in vain is still sitting at the helm working out the counsels of his own will. Also, Protestants have come to a time when they are unsure about anything, don't know what to believe. At the same time they are unsure, Rome is asserting herself as being altogether sure. They haven't changed at all. In the meeting of bishops last week, they reaffirmed their faith. They appear to be sure. And this is strengthened by Protestant apostasy, a double-barreled effect as the devil is preparing the world for the final crisis. Apostate Protestantism, on the authority of human reason, cast out creation. Romanism, on the authority of tradition, cast out the Sabbath, removing the barriers so that mother and daughters could get together again. But we have a message to bear, and a Sabbath to uphold, as a standard against both of these evils. It is a sign that we have no part in either. It is a sign of our allegiance to the true God. It is a sign that our hope is not in vain. It is a sign that we are willing to obey God and not man. That's the meaning of it in God's remnant church today. Beloved, Christ is coming soon. The storm soon will break. I would like to give you four reasons why Christ has got to come. Not just that he just promised, but he's got to come. One of them, the awesome weapons that are in the arsenals of nations today. And keep in mind that these weapons are controlled by men who do not believe in God, who are not under the control of the Holy Spirit. They're only restrained by the angels of God. And those who created these weapons have said, one day one is going off by mistake or by folly, for madmen have their fingers on the buttons. If Christ doesn't come, men will destroy this earth. The second reason he's got to come is called by an article which I have in my Bible, the greatest problem even greater than the H-bomb. And that is the problem of population explosion. It took 5,000 years to get 1 billion people on earth, according to an article I read recently. It took only 100 years to get the second billion. It took only 35 years to get the third billion. Last year, I was sitting in a motel in Oakland, California, watching the news when suddenly there was a break in the news. A news bulletin announced to the world that the fourth billionth person had just been born and was alive on earth. It took only 15 years. That same newscast said the fifth billionth person will be born in seven years. And without some unspeakable catastrophe, by the year 2020, there will be 16 billion people on earth. Which means there will only be one square foot of land for each person. Now how on earth can you house a person and feed a person and sustain a person on one square foot of land? Christ has got to come or this problem will, will overwhelm and destroy this world. The next problem is food. Christ has got to come because we can't feed the people now. I have been to countries where garbage trucks or or trucks like that go through the streets early in the morning before the tourists come out and pick up the bodies of starved men and women and children that have died during the night and they load them the way you load a garbage truck and haul them out of sight. Ladies and gentlemen, Two-thirds of the world's population goes to bed hungry every night. I know this is strange to us who waste so much. There are nations of people who would be happy to live out of our garbage cans. Now with the increasing population, the problem is getting worse. Christ has got to come. Or the nations of earth will starve to death. And the fourth reason he's got to come is what's happening to our water. I recently subscribed to a new magazine called New Times. Last week, the cover is a, is, is, is a picture of, uh, of a fish dead in water. And it's talking about the pollution of our water supply. In Alexandria, Virginia, just across the river from Washington, D.C., they have decided that the drinking water is carcinogenic. It causes cancer. 
And if that's true in Alexandria, it's true in many, many, many other places on this earth. The water supply today is dangerously polluted and dangerously short. There are nations where children are not allowed to play in the noonday sun lest they perspire and drink more water. In Shenzhou province in China, they have to haul in the total water supply for over 30 miles so that the people might be sustained from day to day. It is a serious problem. So Christ has got to come. He's got to come because of weapons. And in Revelation 11 and verse 18, the Bible makes it very clear that when he comes, he will destroy those who would destroy the earth. He's going to take care of that problem. Christ is not going to let man blow up this world. He has reserved the honor of destroying sin and this world for himself, and he will not do it until he removes his people from it. Christ's coming will solve that problem. The second one, overpopulation. His coming will take care of that problem. For when he comes, the majority of people are going to be left right down here. They aren't going anywhere. And those who are used to following the crowd will be left right here with them, for the crowd has never been right. In Noah's day, the crowd was drowned. A few went into the ark. In the days of Lot, the crowd was destroyed. Only three made it to safety. In the days of Christ, the crowd rejected the truth. The crowd has never been right. And the majority of people will be left right here when Jesus comes. And he's going to take us to a city... One city that is bigger than North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida put together. One city. And then when you think of it, in that city there'll be no jails, no hospitals, no sanatoriums, no police stations, no cemeteries, no churches. There's going to be plenty good room in my Father's kingdom, in the words of the old Negro spiritual. When Christ comes and takes his people home, then the Bible answers the next two problems in one verse. Revelation 7 and verse 16 says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Christ's coming will solve the problem of food shortage and water pollution. He knows this and he must come soon. He wants his people to get ready for that coming. He wants those of us who know the truth to live so that he can empower us, so that our witness will be a powerful witness, that when men and women hear us talk about our faith, they will be compelled. Ellen White says, when we are thus imbued with the Holy Ghost, hypocrites will be scared to join the church. Won't that be a mighty day? When those who do come, stay. When those who do come are truly converted, who come in for the right reason. God has given us a great and marvelous privilege when he made us members of his remnant church. And our responsibility now is to carry this with an urgency and with a spirit of desperation to men and women who don't know it. And we ought to start in our own families. And that's where revival will start, ladies and gentlemen. It's not going to start because you bring some preacher in. I don't care which one of us it is or which one yet to come it will be. Revival isn't going to come because of that. Revival is going to start when one man in his house decides that he wants to give up sin, his pet sins, his pet foolishness, and be a strong Christian for Christ. And then when he shares that with his wife, revival will spread, and the two of them will kneel together, and revival has begun with the parents, and then the children will be brought in, the family altar reestablished, and revival will take over that family. And then when that family comes to church... Under the Spirit of God, revival will spread in the pew. It's got to start with one person in his home. And Christ wants to begin it with you. Last year, in one of my favorite places, a terrible catastrophe took place in Loveland, Colorado. You remember the bursting of the dam and the wall of water with all its terror rushing down upon people camping, enjoying themselves. But there is a sad, sad story that comes out of that sad, sad story. The people in charge, the, the policemen got in their cars when they realized the impending catastrophe and they began speeding down the valley, warning people to escape for their lives, yelling with the top of their voices through the bullhorns, escape to higher ground, escape to higher ground. A person who lived there talked with me and tried to tell me about the destruction they have never accounted for all the missing people. Many bodies were found and could not be identified. The terror of the ravaging water had took all the hair away. 
and the mouths were so clogged with mud they couldn't even identify them by their dental work. It, it's an awful thing to even think about. But these were people who heard a warning, escaped to higher ground, escaped to higher ground. But some were relaxing in their tents and in their beautiful campers. They heard the warning and they raised up and they thought about it a minute or two. But then they remembered how peacefully they were resting and they rode over and went back to sleep or continued their conversations. Some had T-bone steaks on the fire. And what can you do? Run to higher ground and leave these at $3 a pound? We can't afford to do that. And so they stayed by uh, chucking the charcoals, you see. And others were downstream fishing and the fish were just beginning to bite. They wouldn't dare leave now, maybe later, but not now. Until it was too late. Until the battering, shattering, consuming waters came down upon them in such fury that man cannot describe it, and they were swept to their deaths. But I told you out of this sad, sad story came another sad, sad one. And the person who lived in Loveland told me about it. She said that one of the men who knew the danger, who drove one of the cars, who shouted through the microphone, one of those commissioned to give the warning to others, was himself lost in the flood. And I thought, how serious that is. How that ought to speak to us, to whom has been given a commission, a warning message. We who know, who are children of the light, wouldn't it be sad for those of us who have been given such great privilege to be lost? To be lost? This morning, Christ wants men and women to consider their estate, to surrender to his power, to get ready, not just for his coming, but for this age, and prepare others for his coming. To get ready to be a sterling witness, to carry the message with power. I ask you this morning, don't you want to be one of those? This is a special time for prayer, not just to hear some visitor come in and talk, but a time for heart searching, a time for prayer. The possibilities of this seminar at least occurred to me and made me quite excited about what your leadership here is trying to do. But ladies and gentlemen, don't let it just be a form, something you witness. Don't let it become entertainment. It is a great opportunity to renew your relationship with God. And God stands ready. Are you ready? If you are, I ask you now to stand again and let us talk to the Lord in prayer. If you really mean it now, even in the back rooms where the television is, if you really mean it now, let heaven see your little act of faith. Let heaven know that you're sincere. And let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege we've had today of being in your house and in your presence. We want to thank you for calling us out of darkness into this marvelous light. And yet, Lord, somehow it never seems to dawn upon us the awesome responsibility which goes along with this privilege. Oh, Lord, you've said that if we know and don't do, we'll be beaten with many stripes. It's going to be worse for those of us who've had this great privilege, if we are lost, than for those who never acknowledged you as Lord. And since we feel that this morning... And with that, since our need, we stand again in response to this appeal. And we stand to say to thee and to all of heaven, We are weak, but thou art strong. Cover us with thy strength. We doubt when we should not. Cover us with thy faith. Lord, we hate when it's evil to hate. Cover us with thy love. Cover us! as the father covered the prodigal so that the stench of his pig pen experience was not exposed. Covered with the rich garments of a loving father so that others could not see his shame. Please cover us today for we are prodigals in thy sight. We have failed this week, some of us this morning. And Lord, there is no hope for us apart from Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And so we ask to be covered with his life today. We ask to be washed in his blood, forgiven 
of our sins, whether we consider them small or great, wash them away and give us clean hearts and renew the right spirit within us. A spirit to be humble and submissive and useful and faithful to thee. Bless everybody, Lord, who stands today. Well, we come in the worthy name of Jesus and ask it for his sake. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International Copyright American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. To order CDs or audio cassettes of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 1-800-233-4450. International calls, please dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. American Cassette Ministries is not a one-man band. It's an orchestra with outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Cassette Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. Our email address is info at americancassette.org. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and financial support are important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon.